بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع نفوسنا أبا القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين لا سيما بقية الله روحي وأرواح العالمين لتراب مقدمه الفداء أما بعد respected scholars Elders, brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Inshallah, as we commemorate tonight the martyrdom of one of the descendants of our second Imam, Imam Hassan al Mujtaba, alayhi afdal al salati wa salam. We look at, and we want to look at particular aspects of this great personality's life, this personality that may have been overlooked to the wide majority of the population, especially the people living outside the lands of Iran, and especially where the person that we commemorate tonight, known as, or referred to as Shah Abdul Azim al Hassani, in which, he, in which we tonight look at his life from Australia, Sydney, and we seek to analyze some important factors in his life and try to, at the very best, and within the time restraints that we have, see what significance and what role he played. And we want to take that and try to apply it on a 21st century perspective, a level in which we can take it from it nowadays, because we commemorate him and he died thousand years ago. And however, if we look at it nowadays, how does his death and how does his life affect our life? How is it that we can learn from his life and put it into practice? Now, when we look at his life, there are many things that we can look at. Within the limited hadith that we have, the first and foremost is we know that this particular person, and obviously it was taken around in the messages, that this person, if you visit his shrine, and this is a hadith from Imam Al-Hadi, alayhi afdal salati wa salam, says, if you visit this person's shrine, and also narrated by Imam Al-Askari, he says, if you visit this particular person's shrine, it's as if you have visited Imam Sayyid al-Shuhada, Imam al Hussein, alayhi afdal salati wa salam. Now we all, every single person here, in the mosque of Imam Hussein, Hussein at Ali Yasin, when we look at this particular aspect, and we know the rewards associated with such a ziyara, the ziyara of Imam al Hussein. We want to realize what kind of person was this that his ziyara and his visitation of his shrine is equivalent to that of Imam al Hussein. Not in all aspects, obviously. But when we look at it in perspective, who is this particular person that we need to analyze? Now we look at Shaykh Sadduq when he analyzes this particular person's life. And he says, This Imam, this descendant of the Imam, Shaykh Abdul Azim, this particular person, he always used to go towards the Imams and show them and tell them his aqidah. Now as you think to yourself, he's a descendant of an imam. As he's directly descended from the imam. He associates with who? He came with Imam Rida, alayhi afdal salati wa salam. Muhammad al-Jawad, Ali al-Hadi. That's, that's the people that he kept in close contact with, the imams. However, look at this particular important factor. Every single time he'd see them, or from time to time, he would tell them, this is my belief. This is my aqidah. Can you make sure it's correct? Can you ensure that I'm on the right path? That's the particular person that when you visit him, his ziyarah is equivalent to Imam Hussein in a narration. Now let's look at this particular aspect. He goes to Imam Al-Hadi and he says, can you check my aqidah? He says, what do you believe in? He says, I believe in Allah and he begins to say particular aspects of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Each one is more detailed than the other. Then he goes on after he 
extracts the idea of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he moves on and he says that because of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I have deciphered and I have come to the conclusion that what? That the Prophet Muhammad is his messenger. Sallu alayhi. And because I came with the conclusion that the oneness of Allah leads to the prophethood of the Prophet of Islam, I have deciphered that there is no other way for this religion to continue except with the Hajjah. And I came to the conclusion that he's Wali and is entrusted Wali after the Prophet of Islam, the guardian of the message of Islam after the Prophet is Ali and his descendants. Sallu alayhim. Now, now someone may come forth and say, well, obviously, we're, we're in the school of thought in which we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe in the Prophet of Islam. We believe in Ali ibn Abi Talib. We believe in the 12th Imams. The person, when he went to Imam, Imam al-Hadi, he tells him, he tells him, I believe A, B, C, D. And then he states each and every Imam up until he got to him. He says, and I believe that you are the Hujjah of Imam al-Hadi. Then the Imam asks him, this is an important factor for today. The Imam asks him, he says, and after my son, Hassan al-Askari, he says, the 12th Imam, he says, he will be in occultation. Do you believe in him as well? This is an important factor. He says, you will not be seeing him. The people at the end of time will not be seeing him as you see me. Oh, Abdul Azim. He says, you will not be in contact. He may be around us. He may be in this very majlis. He may be a person that we come across every single day. When the Imam comes, there's narration that states that when the Imam comes, we'll look at the Imam and say we recognize his face. Because at one stage or another, he's assisted us in something. He's come across us. We've seen him. He says it's an occultation, yes. You don't have direct relations with him, yes. He is here. He is taking care of the Shia. And now let's look at it in perspective. Not only the Shia, every single person on earth. He is the Hujjah of Allah on earth. Now the perspective I want to take from tonight is what? Is this aspect of the Aqidah. This aspect that we take into consideration. And when, that we have to take into consideration. That we have to every single day remind, remind ourselves. Every single day Put the calculations in front of us. Make sure that we are on the right path. Make sure that what? Because there's one aspect that we've said in the past. Having knowledge of the message of Allah. But there's an entirely different entity putting it into practice. That's where belief comes into place. If you have knowledge. How many people do we know that are knowledgeable? As in people come forth. And I'm taking, say, taking it from a perspective where I don't have much wisdom. I don't have much experience in the world. As in, what's a 20 plus year old know about life? How many people has he met? Especially the older generation can tell you this. People that are not religious. People that don't pray and fast. People that do stuff that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says stay away from. Some of these people, not the majority, some of these people have more knowledge but have chosen to go against Allah. You tell them history, they'll tell you every single war that came. They tell you sharia, they tell you every single jurisprudential argument. Do you pray? He says no. Why? That's the question. When you have belief in Allah, when you have belief in the day of judgment, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran says, وَذَكِّرْهُمْ بِأَيَّامِ اللَّهِ What does it mean? And remind them of the days of Allah. One of the days is what? Is the day of death. Is the day that each and every individual will die. The one thing every single person on earth, the one particular thing that every single pe person on earth knows for a hundred percent certainty that he will die. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian, you're an atheist, you're a Muslim, you're a Jew. It doesn't matter. You go to an atheist, do you think you'll live forever? Obviously, he's saying no. Remind him. Don't you want to do good in your life? Don't you want to plant your akhirah? When you remind them of the day of judgment, when you remind them the day of death, 
then they'll begin to reconsider what they've done in this world. Then they'll begin to take into analogies. What have I done? What must I do to achieve my goal? What must I do to achieve the goal in which pleasing the Imam Sahib al-Asri was zaman? Each and every one of us, every individual in this particular room, craves to look at the Imam. For our eyesight to be blessed. If you don't have to look at the Imam, look at where he steps, the dust under his feet. We crave that. But how do we act? That's the question that we have to take into consideration tonight. Is knowledge enough? Without a shadow of doubt, knowledge is not enough. Because we said shimmer on the 10th of Muharram, and we've said it before, and I'll repeat it, because it's something that we have to put into aspect. Shimmer had knowledge of the Imam, didn't he? He cries on the chest of the Imam. He couldn't bear killing him because he was looking at him while he was uttering the Holy Quran. He turns him over so he doesn't look at his face. And then he strikes him 12 times. He takes his head towards Ab Abaydullah ibn Ziyad in Kufa. He says, I know this person. I know who I've killed. I know. And he says the famous lines. Give me silver and gold up to my knees because I have killed the man that is the greatest at the time and has the greatest mother and father. Tell me, does this person not know who the imam is? That's a question. He had knowledge of the imam. What did he do? The worldly desires when they come. The aspects that Allah tests you in. The aspect that someone may bribe you. That the majority might go towards a particular place and you go against yourself and Allah and go with them because they're the majority. In the Quran, everywhere you look, it says the mukhlasin, the people that are a handful, the people of the book, the people that are righteous, the people that Allah has chosen. Go and tell me where it says the majority. Go read Surah Al-Waqi'ah from the start to the end. Where does it say? Thulleh. Imam Zain al Abidin, after the incident of Karbala, he looks at a particular shepherd that had sheep alongside him. And he looks at his companion. He says, What? He says, he says By Allah, we, and he says, We, Ahlul Bayt, don't have lovers. We don't have anyone loving us in Mecca and in Medina as much as there are sheep behind this person. He says, I counted them and there were 20 heads. He says, 20 heads, 20 sheep. He says, there was not 20 people in Mecca and in Medina that loved the Ahlul Bayt. That's who, the words of who? Imam Sajjad. Imam Zain al Abidin. After the tragedy and the incident of Karbala, not on a normal occasion, after the incident, everyone began to know who the Ahlul Bayt are. Imam wrote three particular texts that distributed the, the school of thought. Risalat al-Huquq, Dua Makaram al-Akhlaq, Sahif al-Sajjadiyya. You just open it. It has everything that you need in it. It has du'as that you've never thought of in your life. It has du'a before you even recite du'a. Every single aspect is accounted for in Islam. And when the Prophet says kahatain, and he says about the Ahlul Bayt and the Book of Allah, it means what? As much as the Quran applies to our lives, the Ahlul Bayt will apply. And we commemorate a person that knew this particular aspect, knew that the importance of knowledge, the importance of application, the importance of reviving his soul, reviving his accounting, and saying what I have done and what I must do. That's why we commemorate him. That's why there's a shrine built on top. That people come and have their blessings when they go towards this particular shrine in Iran. Now another aspect I want to draw your attention to. And it applies to this particular scenario. The idea that against all odds, you have to stand firm. And Allah will be with you. The example is of Imam al Hassan, because when we commemorate Abdul Azim al Hassani, it's because he's what? He's direct descendant of Imam al Hassan. Now, some people, I'm not saying everyone, but some people may come forth and say, 
Imam Hussein is greater than Imam Hassan. Someone might come forth and say that. And we ask them why. He says, because of the incident of Karbala, the bravery of Imam Hassan. Alam al Majlisi has a beautiful statement. He says, every single person, every single Imam had a role to play. If any incident happened when they were exchanged, as an example, if Imam Hassan was put in Imam Hussein's position and Imam Hussein was put in Imam Hassan's position, would they act the same way? The answer is yes. Because at that particular stage of Islam, it needed a particular aspect. It needed a particular stance. When the Prophet says, my, my sons Hassan and Hussein, Imaman, whether they stand or sit, that's the concept, that's the idea that Imam Hassan was put in Karbala, he will do the same thing Imam Hussein did. If Imam Hussein was put in Imam Hassan's position, he would do the exact same thing. It's one light, one message, one divine protection of Islam. And look at how much they've sacrificed for us and what have we done in return. How much do we know about their lives? Imam Hassan, I want to put a scenario into perspective. Look at it nowadays. Look at the greatness of Imam Hassan. Look at it nowadays. And let's look at it in the concept of, let's say, a particular ruler that is an oppressive ruler, a tyrant, a dictator, someone that we're all familiar with. Let's take as an example Saddam. Saddam, ruler of the time, had money, weapon, people, not necessarily people that wanted to be with him. Obviously, some were forced against their wills. Others were threatened. And a large majority was actually helping him. Now, he had these three aspects. Wealth, people, and weaponry. If someone comes forth in front of Saddam, for example, at his time, at his peak, and he says, as an opposition, as a mu'arad, and he says, I want to have a ceasefire. And this person asks him, Saddam's going to ask him, he says, well, do you have people alongside you? And this person will say, no, I don't have anyone. He says, okay, do you have any weapons? And that person, the opposition will say, I don't have any weapons. And then he says, do you have any money that you can back up what you say, buy people out? And that person will say, no, I don't. How, how far do you think that particular opposition will go? No money, no people, and no weaponry. As in... He's lucky that that person, this particular person has been beheaded there and then. Imagine, that's the position that Imam Hassan was in. Muawiyah. At the time, he owned the people through money. He owned the weapons. And he owned the wealth, the treasury was under his hand. He had all of that. Someone of a grand stature, the image of Allah, the mirror of Allah's message, the guardian of Allah's message on earth, Imam Hassan al-Mujtaba at the time. What does he do? Does he have wealth? Does the Imam have, have an abundance of wealth in which he can buy the people out? Muawiyah did that. Imam Hassan would never do that. Imam Hassan would never do that. That's the difference between the Ahlul Bayt and those that opposed. Imam Hassan doesn't, anyone in religion doesn't buy someone. If you don't have faith in that particular person, he's not going to try to force you into his religion. Imam Hassan didn't have any loyal people. His general stabbed him in his leg because he was bought out by Muawiyah. So therefore, Imam Hassan didn't have people with him. Everyone was bought out against Imam Hassan. He didn't have wealth with him. And he didn't have weaponry. Imagine, he has none of the above. We said in the example of Saddam, if someone was to come there, he wouldn't even take him seriously. As in, what do you have to threaten me with? Muawiyah and Imam Hassan. Imam Hassan had himself. But look at the position of Imam Hassan. He says, I am going to write a treaty. And I am going to tell you these are the rules and regulations. If you sign on, then will come to an agreement. And these, that in its perspective, in itself, shows you the greatness of the Imam having nothing, however his word being heard. That's number one. Number two, look at the magnanimous nature 
and the intelligence of the Imam, the divine intelligence of the Imam that he knew that in writing this treaty, he will show what kind of person Muawiyah is. How? Look at the particular points that he raised. One of the points, if you die, the Khilafah returns back to me, and if I die, it returns to Imam Hussein. Number one, did Muawiyah uphold this? No, he gave it to Yazid. That's number one. Number two, do not kill any of the followers of Ahl al-Bayt. And you, you know everyone knows who he's killed and who he hasn't. But I want to give you a controversial example. He killed the son of Abu Bakr, known as Muhammad ibn Abu Bakr, one of Imam Ali's, as we refer to them, disciples. That's what a great person he was. Number two. Number three, he said, stop the cursing of my father, Ali ibn Abi Talib, on the pulpits. Did he? After, after Muawiyah, 70 years until it stopped. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, for a periodical time, stopped the cursing of Ali ibn Abi Talib. That's just some of the aspects that he gave to Muawiyah, none of which he kept. But to show us from one perspective that he is so grand that he had no one by him, no wealth, no people, no weapons. However, he can bring a tyrant to his knees with words, with position, with character. And the second position is trying to show you what kind of person Muawiyah is by revealing his true nature. But that's the image that we have till today. That people still say, no, Muawiyah was a good person. Image till today that people, when they are asked, and this is a defining factor. When we're put in a scenario where someone has to choose between Muawiyah and Ali and Safin, you ask them. Tell them, would you fight alongside Muawiyah or would you, like, would you fight alongside Ali ibn Abi Talib? People till today will say, I will, would, have fight, would have fought with Muawiyah. Or you find people like Abu Huraira, in which they looked at him. He says, you're the narrator of hadith in the time of Safin. Where are you? What's happening? Do you take Ali's side or do you take Muawiyah's? Where are you? People look towards him. He's standing on a patch of sand and he says, As-salaa wa ra'u Ali. He says the prayer behind Ali is much more rewarding. rewarding. Afdal. And he says the food with Muawiyah is much more, as we say, oily. Desim. He says, nah, the food with Muawiyah is much better, but the salah with Ali is better. But what? For me, Abu Huraira, I'll stand on this tell. Well, we'll ala tell al -Islam. He says, whoever wins, I'll go, for, go after them. That's the position that we're in. That's the position that we're in. When we're giving this aspect and we commemorate this man, this man had position. This man knew who he fought for. He knew his aqidah. He knew his imam. Do we know our imam? We know his name. We know who, when he was born, how many, how many days he was in occultation. Do we know what we have to do in preparation of the imam? Do we know that the imam, or do we have a factor that we know that the imam is watching our everyday actions? Every Friday, our a'mal are given to him. Do we know that? There's aspects that we have no idea about the imam whatsoever. There is aspects that we have to learn and put into practice. That's why we have to look at ourselves first and foremost. I want to give you a personal perspective of debates. Number one, we have to strengthen ourselves. And I'll tell you why. When someone comes forth, and at university, and whoever's gone through this may or may not have gone through this in the university. There was a particular stage two or three years ago when people would just take our turbas, would take our blessed turbas and would break them. We'd have them in the musalla, all aside, minding their own business. People will come, will come the next day, they're broken. Or at the back of them, it's written shirk. The importance of our religion and the difference between the school of thought of Ahlul Bayt and those against Ahl al-Bayt is that, and a very definitive line, is that the school of thought of Ahl al-Bayt teaches us that you have to elevate yourself. You have to keep progressing. The Imams say, if you do not progress this day more than yesterday, you are not from our Shia. Ali ibn Abi Talib says this. He says, if you want to be of our Shia, you must better yourself, increase your knowledge. Elevate your rank. Imagine. These people at university, personal perspective, they write shirk and they break the turbas. Now, someone may come forth and retaliate, as they did. People came forth and took their stuff. 
It's an automatic retaliation. It, I'm not saying that it was a good retaliation. We shouldn't sink down to their level. The importance is where? Is knowing the aspect of turba. So that when someone comes and attacks us, you know how to defend it. When someone comes forth and attacks us, we know how to defend it. Why? Because you might not see, or you may not see how or why or what effect it may have on that person, but that person may have an effect on another. I'll give you an example. One particular person, he was very anti Ahlul Bayt. Let's just put it that perspective. This person, we were studying at the university, exam periods. Everyone studying, this person had his computer louder than anyone else. He's watching all these videos of the particular group at the time that were fighting. I don't know, at the time, I think it was FSA or it wasn't ISIS at the time. And then he looks towards me and he says, Sayyid, he didn't know what's happening, what's religion, what sect I was in. He says, Sayyid, what do you think of this? And I'm looking and there's these people fighting and they're cursing the Shia. And they're cursing our, the Ummul Masaib, Sayyid Zainab. And what kind of perspective will I have? Imagine people around you, and you're putting into that position. I could have easily retaliated. People around me, there was Shia that could have easily retaliated, but everyone was minding their own business. This person begins to talk. Five hour conversation in which we discussed at the conclusion of it, turba. He talked about aqidah. We talked about the turba. And I asked, I told him at the end of the conversation, he says, I am the follower of Ahlul Bayt. I believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's prophet is the prophet Muhammad. And I believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wali is Ali ibn Abi Talib, and I began to tell him all the Imams, and I said the true message, and that we believe in is derived from Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. <laughs> this particular person had a problem. Why? He says, My father, look at the particular aspect, he says, My father never taught us this. He says, this is not the aqeedah, that's the wording he uses, it's not the aqeedah that my father taught me. And my father would not appreciate me talking towards people from this particular school of thought. Now, when we, dis when we discuss this, we discuss the turba, and I told him, what do you think of this? Because he was one of the people that were approving of the people destroying the turbas in the mosques. Approving of the people writing shirk on these particular turbas. What happened? We're discussing it. Subhanallah, at the time there's tawfiq. People may come, they might have the knowledge but not sustain it in particular aspects. When you need that knowledge, you, you, just, you just forget it. But alhamdulillah, that particular time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded me of the particular aspect of the turba. And we began a particular discussion. I brought forth a hadith, he brought forth logical aspects that he thought were logical. At the end of it, I brought forth we went to the library and we looked at the person that hates, of one of the people that hates the Ahlul Bayt more than any other. As I don't want to say it on the pulpit, but just for a reference, and because it's being recorded, Ibn Taymiyyah, one of the people that has hatred towards Ahlul Bayt, not normal hatred. Go look at his books, what has he written about the Turba? And I told him, look, you believe in him? He says, yes, of course. And I says, do you know what he says about the Turba? Do you know what he says about praying on dirt and praying on clay and rocks in reference to the sujada? He says, no, I haven't read it. He says, go read it. Because it says in his words, if you pray on the sujada, that's bid'ah. And that's going out of Islam. However, the prophet, and he says it himself, he says, if you pray on the rock and you pray on the dust, of this earth, that is what the Prophet did. I told him, where's the bid'ah? The problem is where? When the person is asked, don't talk to a Shia. Because they will magically turn your head. They have magic. The Prophet, what was he called when he first brought the message? When he had logic, when he had beautiful poetry. Perfect poetry, perfect wording of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Was he or was he not called a magician? I ask you. 
The first thing they called him was a magician. Nowadays you find it, it repeats ourselves. History repeats itself. When you have logic, when you have a perspective in which you can bring the masses with your knowledge, with your intellect. Not saying yours as in ours. We're saying yours as in from and derived from Ahlul Bayt. When Imam Sadiq says there is not a rock that you lift except the knowledge found under it is from us. That's the aspect of knowledge. And what knowledge do we have that we think all these advances, all these medical advances, all these particular theories that we come up with perspectives, all these medicines that come into place, chemistry, biology, physics. Imam Sadiq says everything that you have on this earth is but one letter of the alphabet. Elephant. غير معطوفة. That's all you have. And you think that you're great. Now, inshallah, to conclude tonight, it's to give you an aspect, if we don't take anything from tonight, is this. Is that when we remember such people, is that when we come towards the mosques, we want to better ourselves. Yes or no? Yes. That's the first aspect. When we want to better ourselves, we have to find out how. Because we know why. We know why we should better ourselves, without a shadow of doubt. But how is it that we must better ourselves? Each and every particular person betters themselves in a different perspective. The negatives in a particular person in me is different than any other person in this room. That's why we have to strengthen this within ourselves. We have to know what our faults are in order to strengthen them. We have to know what knowledge we're missing in order to strengthen it. We have to go towards our ulama. Go towards our maraja. Tell them what is it that we have to do. Where is it that I can, I can better ourselves? Not as an individual only, but as a community. How is it that we can work together to prepare for the Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman When we take that into perspective, brothers and sisters, put it, let's put it into a modern society. In the modern day, we say and we know for a fact that lying is haram, backbiting is haram. A, B, C, D, haram, haram. But when it comes to practice, when it comes to practice, when Imam Zain al Abidin, he says, not in Mecca or Medina, 20 people that love the Ahl al Bayt, does it mean that they didn't have knowledge? We all have knowledge of Ahl al Bayt. How much do we listen to them? How much do we follow in their footsteps? What do we do when someone is backbiting? What do we do when someone attacks us? Imam, Zain, Imam Ali alayhi salam was sitting around the campfire. Someone comes and he curses Ali ibn Abi Talib. One of, his, one of his men stands up, draws his sword and is about to attack him. Imam Ali says, hold on, hold on, hold on. What are you doing? He says, he's cursed you, O oh, Imam. What does the Imam say? He says, sabun bi sab. Aw afwan an then. He says, you could. There is a concept of Ayn bil Ayn. There is a concept, he does this, you do that, yes. But the greater aspect and the morals of Ahlul Bayt teach us that what? He has done a particular perspective. Leave it with Allah. Malik al Ashtar, when he's attacked in the marketplace, when he's humiliated in the marketplace, he goes towards the mosque. He doesn't attack the person, he goes towards the mosque. The person finds out it's Malik al Ashtar. He runs, he says, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were the leader and the general of Ali ibn Abi Talib's army. Forgive me. He says, I've already forgiven you. That's the reason why I'm in the mosque. Because I prayed two rak'at so Allah may forgive you for what you've done. That's the ashab that we have to look into. this. That's the people that we have to go in their footsteps. Because at any time, we might have an aspect where we think that we elevated. We think that we have knowledge. We think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is happy with us. We may reach this end. At least 6,000 years he prayed to Allah, worshipped Allah. Where is Iblis now? One aspect goes down. There's a particular person, and I end on this note. Barsi Saat, his name was. Jewish rabbi, by most narrations. This person, the narration state that his dua was automatically accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, he was in the synagogues 24-7. He was worshipping Allah, praying towards Allah, gaining closeness towards Allah. 
The king's daughter became sick. They took her everywhere. And everyone would say there's no cure for her. So the king said, I know that there's a rabbi by the name of Barsisa. Take it to him. Take my daughter to him. Barsisa, he comes, he says, what are you doing? He says, no, we want to leave this girl with you. Make the dua, pray to Allah that she's cured. And inshallah, tomorrow we'll come and take her. So Barsi Sadat says, I don't want anything to do with the king. I don't want any aspect to do with this particular. He says, no, we'll pay, we'll pay you in a grand sum. We'll elevate you. We'll give you bonuses. So they left the girl with her, the daughter of the king. He prays. Look at the closeness of this person. He prays to Allah. She's cured. Then what happens? This is the aspect. When I say that we may come forth and when... Any of, any of our grand maraja, any of our ulama, anyone with knowledge, when he's asked, do you do this particular aspect of haram? No way will you see them or find them say, no, I've never done that. Or no, will I do that? What do they say? He says, I seek refuge in Allah when this aspect happens, that Allah guards me. Because it's easy to say that I won't commit this sin. I won't look at this sin. I won't say that particular aspect. But when we're put in the position, there's a different category altogether. Barsisat, what happens? The shaitan begins to speak to him. He says, it's a girl. She's a young girl. She's a beautiful girl. She's in her health. No one will find out. Shaitan, wiswas. So this particular person, the shaitan, is playing with his mind. Remember, he's one of the the people that's always with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his remembrance, all of a sudden he commits an act of atrocity. He commits a haram act. And look, one haram act leads to another. And the Quran states this, Don't go in the aspect, don't follow in the footsteps of shaitan. Don't follow in the small footsteps, whether or the big footsteps, doesn't matter. Don't follow in the footsteps. One haram. Let's count it. Then what does he do? So shaitan comes again and says, well, you've done a com committed haram. What are you going to do now? She's going to go tell the king you've done A, B, C, D. You have to kill her. Second aspect. So he says, you don't have to. He kills her. He says, what am I going to do now? Shaitan comes again. He says, you have to bury her. How they, if they find out you're dead, he goes, buries her. The brothers come back the next day. He says, where's my, our sister? He says, I don't know. I cured her and she left. She left. So they went searching for her. They had no idea that this particular person that's called himself religious has done that particular act. So after he leaves, they look around, look around. Shaitan embodies and he tells the brothers. He says, what, what are you looking for? He says, we're looking for, we're looking for a particular girl. Our, our sister he says, okay. That particular person killed her. I've, saw, I've seen him. And he's buried her in, in their backyard. So he goes. The brothers go. They dig it up. And they find the girl. That particular person is taken away. And he's... The hukum is what? That he will be hung. The king said he will be hung. Prosecuted. His whole life worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then it comes into perspective that what? At the end of his life he's going to be hung. Even in the last dying moments. This person... Sees the shaitan. And he begins cursing the shaitan. He says, look what you've put me through. I have worshipped my whole life because of you. I'm in this place. And shaitan comes again. He doesn't stop there. Shaitan always comes. He doesn't stop there. His last words. Shaitan comes to him. He says, don't worry. I'll save you. He says, how? He says, bow. Just bow to me. I'll save you. He says, I have a rope on my neck. How am I supposed to bow? He says, just with your eyelids. He bows with his eyelids. And he's hung. The shaitan's laughing. He says, I've captured another one of these muttaqin. I've captured another one of these people that you thought, oh Allah, that is close to me. And that's what we have to take into perspective. If we know the Ahl al-Bayt and we know their teachings, we have to elevate our rank. We have to educate ourselves and our children and our friends and our families. And not just educate ourselves, but also put it into practice. And I end on this note brothers and sisters. And inshallah, we pray to Allah that Allah may allow us the ma'rifah of Ahlul Bayt. He may allow us to elevate in 
the rank in the eyes of Allah may increase our knowledge of the Ahl al-Bayt, the ma'rafah of Ahl al-Bayt. And we pray to Allah that he raises us with the ashab of Imam Sahib al-Asri wa zaman Bibarakat. الصورة المباركة الفاتحة تسبقها الصلاة على محمد وآل محمد